Well, good morning, everybody. Great to uh, have you here. Uh, great to see you. Uh, welcome to those of you watching online as well. Uh, my name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here and part of our preaching team. And uh, before we dive into this new series on Nehemiah, I just want to remind you that next week we begin new service times. Uh, new service times kick off next week. They'll be at 9 o'clock and 1045. Uh, masks will be optional. You're welcome to wear them, but not uh, required to. Um, and we will continue to live stream at 9 o'clock and 1045 as well for folks who are out of town or homesick or whatever the case might be. So uh, 9 and 1045, uh, we'd love you to pick one of those. Actually, if some of you at, at this 9, at 930 service would actually pick 1045, uh, that would help a bit because I'm guessing most of the people at 8 are going to pick 9. So uh, anyway, but do what you need to do and uh, we're looking forward to how that will um, develop over the course of the summer and, and maybe at some point in the fall we'll need another third service, but we'll see. So uh, as I said, uh, we're starting this series in the book of Nehemiah and as we start this, I want you to imagine a group of people. I'm going to describe them for you. Imagine this group of people. They had once had a very esteemed status as God's people. They're coming out of a very painful season. Everything that was familiar has now been disrupted. Life as they had previously known it came to a screeching halt. Many in their older generation had passed away. Many of their children have started questioning the importance of their faith. They have a heavy-handed government that controls too many aspects of life. They've gotten back to normal, but only a percentage have actually returned. Everywhere they look, things are not really as good as they used to be. Powerful forces are seeking to divide them. They're a weak and small and shrinking minority amidst a godless majority. They read in the scriptures about how much God loves them and won't ever leave them, but it sure doesn't seem like it matches reality. And they're wondering if all this God stuff is really just too good to be true. Can you imagine a people who felt like that? <laughs> America in 2021? I'm actually talking about Jerusalem in 445 BC. That's the context of the book of Nehemiah. And I think it's the perfect book for us to study throughout the course of this summer. Over these next nine weeks, we're gonna look at how the people of Israel in a very similar kind of mindset and frame of thinking as us, how they rebuilt. How did God bless them? How did they experience the renewal and the rebuilding? And how did it actually point to the ultimate renewer and rebuilder, Jesus? This is, I think, a perfect time for us to begin this study. We're calling it Rebuilding, a study of Nehemiah, and it's perfect for this moment. You might have heard the tagline at the end of that scripture reading that may this word of the Lord help us to be fearless and faithful in a world of discouragement and danger. That's what we hope for this book. That's what Nehemiah is about. Nehemiah is written to a group of people who are discouraged. They feel a lot like you. That whole description that I wrote, I wasn't making that up. This is, as you look at the background and the context of the people of this day, this is everything that they were feeling. They were feeling discouragement. They were feeling like, you know what, God promised this, but it feels like we're experiencing this. It feels like it used to be better than it is now. It's discouraging. It's also dangerous. There's lots of anti-God forces in the world. There were in 445 BC, there are in 2021. And yet in the midst of that, what this book is inviting us to be is a fearless and a faithful people. People who are faithful to God's covenant no matter what it costs. People that stand against the waves of spiritual danger that are coming against us and stand full of fear or full of faith and lacking fear. That's what we're invited to. To be. So I want to just uh, give you some background on this. How did we get here? I realize that anytime we start a new book of the Bible, especially one that's in the crunchy part of your Bible, um, it's important to give you a little bit of kind of how we got here. And even though Nehemiah is relatively toward the front of the book, it actually is, is one of the last things that happens in the Old Testament. And so I want to just give you kind of the story of this. I realize a few of you are very familiar with this story, but many of you aren't. And so this story is actually really helpful for setting the context of where the, the people that we're going to encounter in this book, the, kind of where they're at and how did they get here. So the Bible begins in Genesis 1 with God creating everything good. He creates man and it, woman, Adam and Eve in his image. Everything is good and that doesn't last long. 
Because in Genesis 3, something terrible happens. Adam and Eve, they take the forbidden fruit. They distrust God. Even though God had given them everything they could want, they said, but there's this one thing that we really want that will make us happy. They eat it. And everything's broken. The image of God in them is not ruined, but it's distorted. And all of a sudden, their desires are disordered. And sin enters the world. Well, God's not just going to chuck his good creation. And so he begins a plan to rebuild it, a plan to renew it. And he does that in Genesis 12 through Abraham. Abraham is this man that he calls and he says, Abraham, through you, I'm going to create a nation that's going to be a blessing to all the other nations. Now, Abraham, uh, this calling of Abraham was somewhere around 2166 BC, as best we can tell from history. And so Abraham is called and, and Abraham is called to form a people, the people of Israel. Well, by the time you get to the end of Genesis, the the descendants of Abraham, uh, they're all in Egypt. And uh, so then you turn the page into Exodus, and what you find is 400 years have passed between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, and these 70 or so descendants of Abraham who have been in Egypt have now multiplied into millions of people who are enslaved and in captivity in Egypt. And this is where uh, the movies all kick in, <laughs> right? This is where you have lots of different movies of, of Moses coming on behalf of God and saying, let my people go. And through lots of different miracles and lots of different, uh, really, judgments on the nation of Israel, eventually uh, the people are let go in Exodus chapter 12. And this is about 1446 is when the Exodus takes place. Now, just so you know, uh, I'm aware that this timeline you're going to see is not to scale, Okay, so some of you who are going to nitpick this thing, save it, okay? I know. I just, there's no way to fit it all on one screen and have it kind of make sense unless you, so just imagine, okay? But, so you have... Uh, 2166 is Abraham, 1446 is the Exodus. And the Exodus is people are released from Egypt and they are sent toward this promised land. The problem is, as they're going toward the promised land, they start to long for the old land. You can take the people out of captivity. It's hard to take the captivity out of the people. And we do tend to long for an old life that actually isn't better. And so that generation wanders around in the desert. That first generation actually that experienced the Exodus, God allows all of them to die off. And then the next generation is about to go into the promised land. And before they go into the promised land, Moses gathers them all up and he gives them a series of sermons that we have recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, that word literally means second law. Deuteronomy, second law, second word. And what it is, is it's this reiteration of God's hope and God's purposes for his people as they go into land. It's sort of the the locker room talk. Here it is. And so, so let me just read to you an, a significant portion from Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is what God is predicting as his people are heading into the new promised land. Deuteronomy 4, it says this. When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land. So in other words, years and years from now, generations from now, when that happens, if you act corruptly, by making a carved image in the form of anything, and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left in few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. So in other words, years from now, if you're not faithful to me, if you turn to idols, I'm going to kick you out of this land that I'm about to send you into. You're going to disperse from that. Verse 28, and there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. Here's essentially what he's saying. He's saying, hey, if you decide you want idols, I'm going to give you a bunch of them. Right, this is like the dad who catches his kid dip in Copenhagen. He says, oh, you want to dip Copenhagen? Why don't we have the whole can? And you can't spit it out. You want this? You're going to get the whole thing, right? That's what God's saying. He's saying, if you go after these other idols, I'll give them to you. Listen, God gives rebels what they ask for. And he stuffs our face in the sin and says, is that really better? How's that going for you? But here's the good news, verse 29. But from there, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. 
if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. So, so you get this. They're about to go into the land and God says, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna forget me. You're gonna go after other gods. I'm gonna kick you out. I'm gonna exile you to somewhere else and that's gonna be your wake up call and then you're gonna come back and be faithful to me. Well, sure enough, that's what happens. As you look at the rest of the history of Israel, uh, they drift toward idolatry until finally uh, God allows the, the godless nation of Babylon to come in. You can read about it in 2 Kings 25. Uh, beginning in 605 BC, Babylon begins to take over Israel. It happens in three different waves. It's where you get the story of Daniel. And by the end of it, in about 586 BC, uh, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed, the city's been burned, the city's been ransacked, it's all destroyed, and the people are in exile to Babylon. They're there for about 70 years. And near the end of that time, in the geopolitical structure, something important happens. Babylon actually gets conquered by Persia. That's in 539 BC. So when the people of Israel go into exile, it's in Babylon. When they return from exile, they're coming from Persia, same, same place. It's just ruled by different people. So the exiles start trickling back to Israel in about 536 BC. The Persian government lets them begin to come. And they come in, again, a series, just like they leave in the series of waves, they're coming back in a series of waves. But not many people come back. And they start to rebuild the temple and they kind of start to rebuild the city, but it's pretty weak. At some point, uh, the king who lets them go actually says, wait, 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 not so fast, don't build so much. And the, the construction project starts, stops. And that's when we get to 445 BC in the days of Nehemiah. So it says in Nehemiah 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, this is about November, December, in the 20th year, that's of the reign of King Artaxerxes, as I was in Susa, the citadel. So that's a capital city. So here's a map. This is kind of the last piece of background and then we'll dive into uh, Nehemiah 1. So here's a map. The green part is the, the Persian empire of this time. And you see on the right side of that picture where the red line sort of starts is the city of Susa. Some of you have good enough eyes to be able to see that. Uh, but that's where Nehemiah is. We learn here in Nehemiah 1 that he's a cupbearer to the king. So he's a, a government official in the kind of royal palace. And Susa is a citadel. It's a kind of capital type city. And from there he goes, he follows that red line that you see eventually to Jerusalem. Now in the book of Nehemiah over and over, Israel is called beyond the river. The land beyond the river. It sounds like Lord of the Rings or something, right? Like beyond the river, that's Israel. And so that's a, a map of just of where this happened. This, by the way, this stuff in the Bible, it's not once upon a time. It really happened. And it really happened. And, and it was recorded in, in actually originally the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were just combined as one book. They've since been split up. We're not sure why. But we're studying the book of Nehemiah, which is this story of the people who were unfaithful and kicked out, and now their hearts are starting to be turned back toward God, and they're wanting to rebuild. Let me ask you, what do you want in your life to be rebuilt? Well, and I think there's almost two different ways to think about it. What do you want to go back to normal? And what do you want to go better than normal ever was? What do you want to be rebuilt? What about in your relationship with God? What in your relationship with God would you like to be rebuilt and renewed and revitalized? What about in your family? What about in the Christian church? What about in our influence in the world? What about our witness? Would you like to see be more radiant and beautiful and pleasingly smelling to the Lord? in a hostile and dangerous world? What, what, what would you like to see rebuilt? Well, this is a book about rebuilding. And it's a book that's gonna, especially here in chapter one, be a kind of case study in how faithful rebuilding happens. So this isn't prescriptive, but it's a case study. It's something to look at and go, okay, this is what it might look like to have our lives rebuilt. So five lessons about where rebuilding how rebuilding begins. Number one, rebuilding begins when we grieve over the status quo. Rebuilding happens when we grieve 
over the status quo. Far too many of us are comfortable with the status quo. And Nehemiah experiences and sees, oh, here's how things actually are, and it grieves him. It breaks his heart. Look at verse 2. It was in that year that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. So, so get this. Nehemiah was almost certainly born in exile. He's never been to Jerusalem. He's never been to Israel. But his brother and some other people, they make that trek back, and he asks them, how is it going there? Our people have been sent back. What's it like? Verse 3, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. You know what they say? They say the, the church seems weak and embarrassed and worldly. The next generation's kind of given up on it. A bunch of people decided, you know what, we don't know if we even need this God thing anymore. W what was his response? Huh, interesting. That's an interesting status quo. Thanks for the update. Verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. He's, he's grieving. Uh, notice just the slowness of the language. I sat down and wept and mourned for days. This hits Nehemiah like a ton of bricks. And this amazes me because this guy's never been there. It's not like he can remember Jerusalem in its glory days. He's probably heard stories about it from his family, from his parents, from his grandparents, but he's never experienced it. And yet here's this thing that doesn't even really affect him all that much directly. And he is grieving over it. He's brokenhearted over it. He's sitting down and he's weeping and he's mourning for days. All that language communicates he is not in a hurry to fix it. This is what I want to do, right? When I see a status quo, when I see something happen, I want, my two responses are outrage and action. I got to say something about this because everyone cares what I'll post. <laughs> they will know we are Christians by our anger. <laughs> right, that's what I want to do. Or, or I want to go, well, what do we do? Let's fix it. What's the plan? How do we do this? Where do we go? How do we do it? No, 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 no. Nehemiah doesn't do that. He sits, he weeps, he mourns, and he sits in it for days. We need to grieve before we move to action. You, you can really only have the, the healing and the moving forward and once, you've, once you've grieved. I mean, there, there's like the serious kind of grieving, like you've got to grieve over you know, the death of people. This is one of the things that's been so painful in the last year is people's grieving. You know, people couldn't do funerals. People couldn't do those things. Some of you are still waiting to have a funeral for someone that died months and months ago. And you can't really move forward. Uh, one of my uh, favorite stories of grieving actually comes from my, my college, University of Illinois. Uh, when I graduated, had a really good basketball team and Bill Self was the coach there. And uh, Bill Self was a very good coach. And, and then he, as, right as he had built this team to be a really good team, he left and went to Kansas. That <laughs> jerk. So he goes to Kansas, and we get this new coach, Bruce Weber. And Bruce Weber happens to have inherited what would eventually become a Final Four team. They were very, very good. But they start the season, and they're really scuffling, and they're really struggling, and everyone's doing all this comparing to Bill Self until one day the team walks into practice, and the whole locker room is decorated in black, and Bruce Weber's wearing a black suit and a black shirt, and they're like, what's going on? And he says, here's what's happening. We're having a funeral today for Bill Self because we aren't going to be able to move forward until we let this go. So let's talk about Bill. What did you appreciate about him? What did, you know? And then you move forward. You have to grieve if you're going to move forward. And so often we just skip this step. Let me ask you, what, what needs to be grieved in your life? What have you lost over the last year that you haven't actually taken the time to just feel sad about? To sit in. To weep. To mourn. 
even for days. Rebuilding begins when we grieve over the status quo. Secondly, rebuilding begins when we persevere in prayer. Verse four, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, here's something fascinating. Uh, the, the, the moment that, that's going to happen in chapter 2, where Nehemiah actually gets to intercede to the king on behalf of the nation, takes place, guess how long, after Nehemiah gets this news. He gets this news, and then he's praying, and he's fasting, and he's praying, and he's fasting. For how long before he actually gets a chance to do something about it? Four months. Four months, four months take place between chapter one and chapter two. And so in chapter one, he's recording kind of a summary. Here's everything I've been praying for these last four months. And I said, verse five, oh Lord, God of heaven. That's his favorite way in Nehemiah to refer to God as the God of heaven. He's not just a local God, he's the God of everything. Oh Lord, God of heaven, the great awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. He's praying, he's persevering for months and months and months in prayer. What do we care enough about to actually pray for it for months? They've started this really cool thing at Redemption Tempe. One of the things that's cool about redemption, one uh, family of multiple congregations is the way we can learn from each other. And I wonder if this might be something we do in the days to come. But you got a lot of folks, especially at Redemption Tempe, who want to like do some stuff and change some things and make an impact in the community and that sort of stuff. And so they've actually said, you know what? We want to start these groups. They call them prayer in action groups. We've got a few different ones. I don't know what all of them are. I know one of them is focused on pro-life issues. People saying, we really want to help uh, protect and save the unborn as well as care for mothers who are considering abortion. So that's, that's one of these prayer in action groups. I think another one has to do with issues related to criminal justice reform and, and questions about that. I think, I'm not sure what, what all of them have to do with. I think another one has to do maybe with homelessness in Tempe. I'm not exactly sure. But here's what they do. They, they have these people, they get very fired up about these things. They post a lot of these things and they talk about these issues and they say, okay, you want to do something about it? Join a prayer and action group. And here's what a prayer and action group does. You meet together with other people who are also concerned about pro-life issues and you pray about it for one year. And you know what they find? A lot of people who are all hot and bothered about pro-life they won't commit to pray about it for a year. They just want to post about it for a year. And yet what they find is at the end of a year of praying about this, you really have your heart gripped. You really have your heart moved. You've actually thought through what a plan might be to help. It's a whole different way of thinking. And I think renewal will happen much more from that than from just a bunch of quick action. So we grieve over the status quo. We persevere in prayer. And rebuilding begins third, when we start repenting. When we start repenting. Look at this, how repentance is so central to this prayer in verse six. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. That's the same wording as Deuteronomy 4. In those days when you act corruptly, it says we've acted corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah begins to repent, to confess, to acknowledge, hey, as the people of God, we've blown it. And you know what? Even I have made mistakes. Even I have sinned against you. Even I have gone in idolatrous directions. And the thing that makes me and maybe makes you a little bit uncomfortable is how okay Nehemiah is not just confessing his sins, but confessing on behalf of the people of God. Do you see that in verse six? Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Now think about this for a moment. Nehemiah wasn't even born when the people of Israel 
were sinning in all the ways that got them exiled. He wasn't even born then. And yet, he's not going, well, that was them. Are there things about the people of God today that you're not responsible for personally, but that break your heart? There are for me. Are there things about the people of God, Christians, in history? Yeah. And, and you go, well, what is that? I don't even know how to take responsibility for sins I didn't commit. I'm not sure I do either. But, but I think it's striking that he, we view it as just me. Nehemiah tends to view it as we. And he says, and I'm not immune from this. Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. Seth is off today uh, preaching at uh, the church he grew up in, in Tempe, Grace Community Church. They invited him back to preach there. I think that's really awesome. And so he's there. And uh, one of the stories that, that Seth tells about the time when he left from there to, to begin working at Redemption is one of the first people he met at Redemption uh, from the other congregations was a guy who had tried out for his dad's, for Seth's dad was a basketball coach. And this guy who's a pastor at Redemption had tried out for Seth's dad's basketball team and gotten cut. And it was like a terrible experience for this guy. And he said, hey, your name's, your name's Seth Trout? Is that any relation to Jay Trout? He goes, yeah, he's my dad. Oh. <laughs> and Seth tells the story of going like, I didn't cut the guy. But we, the Trouts, kind of did. And so I have to live in that tension of going, I'm not happy about everything that came before me. And I also have to realize I'm not immune from some of the sins of the past. They might lurk in my heart as well. Even I and my father's house have sinned. This is what it is to begin to experience renewal, is to push into repentance. Rather than putting our guard up and, and listing out all the ways that we're okay, it's, it's instead saying, here's a mirror that I'm going to put up and go, God, search me, know me. Is there any way in me that I need to repent for? This is part of repentance. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's repentance. That's what it is. It's turning. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, that verse is not about the United States of America, but it is about the people of God. We're called by his name. And there is no renewal without repentance. Get this. Repentance is required for renewal. Renewal only happens when you repent, not when you give your resume. We wonder why... Why God is not blessing us as the people of God. Maybe it's because we're always showing him our resume. God, look at, how I, look at how I'm not like them. Look at how I didn't do that. Look at how I'm okay. And you know what we are when we do that? We're like the Pharisee and the tax collector who both went up to the temple to pray, Jesus said. And the tax collector stood a long way off and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But the Pharisee came and said, God, thank you that I'm not like these other people. And Jesus said, you know who went to his house right with God? Not the guy who gave his resume. The guy who came with repentance. This is how renewal really happens. When we say, God, search me, know me. And we repent. And then fourth, re renewal, rebuilding begins when we ask God to move. You see, he gets, uh, he gets pretty clear about it. Verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. So what's Nehemiah doing? He's saying, I have access to the king. I have access to someone that could actually change this. But rather than just hatching a plan and charging in there, I'm gonna pray and say, God, would you give me what only you can give me? which is favor in the sight of the king. One of the things that strikes me when I read the gospels is how often Jesus asks a question that I wouldn't think he needs to ask. 
Do you know what question he keeps asking people? What do you want me to do for you? That's what he says. He, he, he sees a blind man on the side of the road. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He doesn't go, well, obviously you're blind. I know what you need. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Why? Because when we actually articulate what we want God to do, it's a posture of humility. It's a posture of dependence. It's a realization we can't fix it on our own. We can't do it on our own. We need him to do it on our behalf. And that's what Nehemiah is doing. He starts to ask God to move. The Bible says in James chapter four that we have not because we ask not. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Do you want him to rebuild your life with God? Some of you have a story where you go, man, when I was in high school, when I was in college, when I was in my 30s and I just came to faith and man, the Bible came alive and I prayed and I loved the Lord and I worshiped and it just feels like it's dried out. Do you want God to rebuild it? Ask. Do you want God to bring health and healing and restoration in some relationship? Ask. Do you want God to move in the hearts of your friends so that they will treasure Jesus like you do? Ask. Do you want power to fight sin, to resist sin, that besetting sin that just like a weed keeps popping up and you keep tearing it off and you're trying to fight it but you really want the roots to be out? Ask. We have not because we ask not. Renewal happens when we grieve over the status quo, when we persevere in prayer, when we start repenting, when we ask God to move. And finally, when we put our hope in Jesus, not ourselves. You know, there's no uh, mention of a Messiah in this chapter. There's no mention of Jesus. But the book itself as a whole is pointing to a future hope that isn't found in this book. What's the hope of the people in this situation, right? It's in verse nine. If you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, then I'll be with you. Then I'll allow you to be with me. Then everything will go well. If you do this, then I'll be with you. You know what's fascinating about the book of Nehemiah is that toward the end, in, in chapters 10, 11, and 12, the people of Israel, they go through this big renewal service. It's like the last night at camp, you know, and they're writing down their sins and throwing it in the fire like we did on Good Friday, and it's like they're getting all their CDs out of their truck and putting them in the fire too. And some of you remember that. Um, I don't think kids throw their whole cell phone in the fire at camp anymore, but some of them probably should, but anyway. Um, so that's what it is. They're renewing. And, and here's the thing. They go, God, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And, and it would be awesome if the book ended at the end of chapter 12 because it would be like, they made commitments to be faithful to God. Yeah. <laughs> Curtain closes. But that's not where the book ends. I'm going to spoil it for you right now. Do you know how chapter 13 goes? Like in a one-for-one one correlation, it goes, they committed this, but they failed. They committed this, but they failed. They committed this, but they failed. Wah, wah, wah. The book ends on a huge downer. Why? I think the author is trying to say, there's no amount of human if that can create the then that we need. There's no amount of human effort, there's no amount of human commitment, there's no amount of human renewal that we can do. Sin is too deep in us. We have to be changed from the outside. God must intervene. And so what is happening in the book of Nehemiah is it's pointing to a better Nehemiah. Someone else who was in a royal palace, someone else who was far away, who could have been entirely happy to just live his life in heaven forever, but that eternal son of God took on flesh and became Jesus. And he moved into our sin, and he moved into our mess, and he moved into our brokenness so that he could heal our hearts and rebuild us from the inside out. And so listen, we will only be rebuilt 
If we don't look to our effort and we don't even look to our repentance and we don't even look to our grief or any of that, but if we look to him. So, so, so for sure, let's grieve. Let's persevere in prayer. Let's repent. Let's do those things. Let's ask, but let's do it with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Knowing that he and he alone is our only hope. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for how you'll use it to form us and shape us into a faithful people. And God, you'll do that not because we've been faithful, but because you have. And so God, even as we come now to the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of your faithfulness. We're reminded of our need for mercy. We're reminded that uh, God's sin is much deeper in our hearts than we want to acknowledge. And we need your healing and your forgiving touch. God, bring to mind areas where we need to trust you and walk with you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.